Welcome, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. Hybrid, remote, hub spoke home, the death of the open plan, there are lots of ideas about the office, how it should be designed, when and how often we should be there, and what is its actual purpose even after the pandemic? I'm Stephanie Miller, Director of PR for HOK, and I'm joined by two colleagues today, Kay Sargent, Director of Workplace, and Tom Pellucci, our firm-wide Director of Interiors. And over the next 20 or 30 minutes, we're gonna explore some of the workplace themes and trends that Kay and Tom predict for the new year based on their continual conversations with C-suite leaders around the world and across many different market sectors and business types. We invite everybody who's joined us now to post questions in the comment section. We'll leave time at the end of the discussion to address some of them and follow up with any responses we couldn't get to in our LinkedIn feed, where this conversation will remain visible after today's discussion ends. So let's jump in. Kay, why don't we start Give us a lay of the land. Where are we today in terms of the office? Well, first of all, it's been a long three years since our whole world was kind of rocked. But I think it's important to remember that we're still kind of in the middle of an evolving situation, even though we're starting to see it level out just a little bit. But I think there's still some things like economic layoffs, uh, the economic situation, proximity bias. Uh, that will really kind of continue to evolve. And so we're not out of the woods yet. This is still an evolving situation. But what's interesting, Stephanie, is that the third quarter results just came in and there's some surprises in there, some things maybe not so surprising. Um, not everyone has the opportunity to work remotely. There's a lot of conversation right now about those hybrid workers. But 42% of the U.S. workforce doesn't even have that option, whether they're service oriented or facility managers or uh, site dependent. And of that, 47% of the people that actually, like those that can work remotely, 47% are working in a hybrid manner. There's a lot of people that are still kind of going to the office or still working remotely. So that basically means that less than about half of half of the whole workforce or about 27% is really working in a hybrid manner. So there's a lot of conversation about that one topic, but I think we also need to remember that everybody's situation is different. And just because it works for you, doesn't necessarily mean it works for somebody else, right? Not only work styles uh, can vary, but even we're seeing variances around the country and during different regions and also different industries. So work from home actually is bigger in some of the larger cities, but in the Midwest, we're already seeing a pretty big return as occupancy rates are going up. Right now in the middle part of the country, occupancy rates are about 51%. Now that seems low, but they weren't really much higher before COVID. Mm. Uh, in the Northeast and the Northwest, we're probably still seeing depressed members, not as many people coming back in those locations. But there's also kind of this shifting, right? So a lot of people from San Francisco have relocated to Austin, and a lot of people from New York have relocated to Miami, kind of in the finance world. A lot of people in, in LA have moved to Seattle and Nashville as kind of the healthcare and the entertainment and the tech sectors have kind of morphed in those directions. So we're not only just seeing uh, things in different industries, but it's really starting to shift around the countries. I think what was really fascinating, though, is the number of people that have returned to San Francisco and New York, which we often hear are just being hit so hard, has actually increased significantly in the last year. And it might be because a lot of those people that might have moved away initially really are kind of moving back to be closer to the office or maybe new people are moving in. I think that right now there's a, a big discussion about kind of what, what the workforce wants, but then often uh, management might have a little bit of a different view or perspective. And I think there's a lot of concerns right now about the impact of isolation or the quality of what is being produced, the lack of connection to colleagues or mentors or training, the lack of connection to those resources, and what the long-term ramifications are of all of that. And so I think it's really important also that we understand 
But there's a lot of focus being put on that hybrid model in the workplace. And quite frankly, I think that the real estate community is being set up for failure because hybrid is really more of an operational man, a model. Yes, we can do things in the workplace to make it better and to create amazing, enticing spaces. But we have to think about, um, you know, how are you uh, handling your HR situation and your operational things and how are you communicating to your teams? It's really much more and much bigger than just a workplace consideration. One of the kind of highlights or aspects of work that was highlighted for so long was the the digital nomad. Oh, I'm going to go and I'm going to work yeah. in Costa Rica or I'm going to work on a beach in Thailand. Have we seen that die away over the past six months? And do you see that as a reality anymore for the workplace moving forward? Yeah, I mean, you know, for some people that is absolutely still a reality. But I do believe that there are tax ramifications that are coming in. There's proximity bias that is coming in. And a lot of companies, specifically a lot of the big tech companies, are now saying, we kind of want you to be back. And some have even said, if you don't live within 100 miles of the main campus and aren't coming in, we're going to reduce your salary. You know, and other people, in other cases, some people have said, okay, we're going to, we're actually going to pay you more if we can totally get rid of our real estate. So um, I think it's it's something that is still playing out, but we do see uh, digital nomads still happening. Okay. Well, let's to pivot over to Tom. Sure. You are designing large new headquarters for, among many other projects, a tech company, a biopharma leader, and a few others. What are these clients asking you for, and how has it changed, if at all, from the kinds of requests that you would get on these projects before the pandemic or just after? Sure. That's a great question, Stephanie. And thanks for asking it. Um, it's interesting. I think we're in a time of some change in terms of how or what we're designing for a workplace. But I think we were in that change prior to the pandemic anyway. So things have gotten very accelerated. Um, and it's exciting. I, I've you know, for so many years, designing a workplace, I wouldn't say was always a, a simple solution, but we had basically a kit of parts of, of workstations and offices and conference rooms and how you put it all together. And were you creating a solution that was, you know, cost effective, that was using the real estate in the most um, expeditious way possible? And now clients are asking, much more of us from a design perspective. And what I find really interesting in all the projects that I think we're doing right now, either that I have a good fortune of being a part of or our colleagues around the firm, is design matters first and foremost. They want space that is going to attract people back. They have to have a reason and the space needs to look like something. Yeah. I'm thrilled with this. I'm hoping we're going to get away from, you know, the kind of typical materials and finishes and design attributes we've seen in workplaces over and over again. And so I think this is a chance to think about spaces that feel more unique and bespoke and special because they have to be attractive in order to make sure that those folks that are going to be in an organization that are hybrid um, do make the choice to be in the office. And it's not so much that you're being told and it's more about the desire to be there, to be with your colleagues, to be inside this institution and, and do something special while you're there. So I, I can't tell you how many times we're hearing things like, you know, uh, references to airport lounges. Like hmm. we need our space to look like the Delta Lounge. Yeah. And frankly, it's, those spaces, a lot of them are quite beautiful and they're very hospitality forward and focused. And they're about creating spaces where you can collaborate with others and be together and also places where you could tuck away and be focused. And I think it's really brilliant of some of our CEOs and, and real estate client leaders that are, are pointing to that as an, as an example of what they think the future might hold for them when it comes to the creation of workplace uh, for their organizations. And I know another huge focus for many of our clients is trying to address the compelling issues around ESG, diversity, mm -hmm. equity, and inclusion. Are those areas and themes that are 
being voiced as concerns by your CEOs and clients more so now and asking you how their workplace can address these issues? Either mm -hmm. one of you? <laughs> yeah, I'll start. Um, I find it fascinating right now that a number of our clients have individuals in positions inside their organizations that that is their focus, is making sure that there is a level of equity within the workplace and that the design matters most around that. Sure, there's other aspects and other characteristics that are important, but being able to think through and talk about issues that need to be addressed in terms of making sure folks in that organization, in, in, in the space, or maybe virtually connecting to the space, have as much of a level of parity as possible, um, given the way we're working now. Uh, we just finished a meeting today. We had a design meeting with a client where we were talking through furniture options for private offices and, and you know, the issue of, of accessibility in that space and how does someone welcome somebody in that might not be as ambulatory and how do they sit and, and, and occupy that space and be comfortable uh, is critical. And I think that's a really nice example because those things were always present, but now they're much more top of mind. Hey, Kay, do you think? Yeah, well, and yeah, Tom, yeah, you know, I think it's interesting too, because as a lot of our clients are looking at their ESGs, one of the exercises that we do is we go and we look at, okay, what are your ESG goals and your priorities? And for many of them, let's say they have a list of 15, you know, we can go back and say at least eight, nine, 10 of these, we can have a positive impact on depending on how we design the space, right? So doing nothing isn't really an option. I also think it's interesting that uh, as our clients are looking for talent and they're broadening that spectrum of who they're reaching out to, they are encountering a wider spectrum of people uh, on the diversity scale. And they're having to address diversity, equity, inclusivity, and accessibility to the next level, really to make sure that their spaces are welcoming for all of that talent. Well, you're picking up a thread that I want to get to, but we apparently have, we have questions and comments coming in hot and heavy. So we're going to put you on the hot seat right away. All right. Here we go. Uh, one of them is a great question. How can we design hybrid workplaces to assist collaboration? <laughs> yeah. Ooh, so I, okay. I, yeah. Well, I'm laughing because we just had this conversation today with our we entire did. team. Right. So part of it is uh, we need to rethink uh, the way that we're designing gathering spaces, right? So, you know, if people are coming in to gather and to meet, and or if you're bringing people in that are hybrid, you know, the standard shove the biggest rectangular table that you can in a room with the maximum number of chairs and a little teeny monitor at the end of the wall, that doesn't cut it anymore. Quite frankly, Tom and I, we were literally just talking about that. That probably hasn't cut it for 10 years. So we need to really rethink what kind of engagements are you having? Is it I'm presenting to you or are you an active participant? And then um, we need to, we really need to design those meeting and gathering spaces. It's, think of it like it's like a stage and for the play or the act that you're doing, you might have a different setup. And so we really had to have a deeper understanding about what kind of meetings and the level of participation and the number of people, and do you want them to be open and closed, et cetera. So we're diving really and, deep into that topic. And how formal and how informal they are, as you're talking yeah. about the idea of stage, and it might be more of a presentation, but we also recognize that collaboration can happen, you know, in that fortuitous encounter with someone. And are there spaces throughout an environment that two people could grab one another and go huddle over something or four people can say, hey, let's take this conversation elsewhere. I want to pull something up on a screen or as Kane, I love, maybe get a little analog and draw something instead of having to always be on some big, you know, OLED thing. So yeah, the I'm a chance, one. right? Well, the chance to be able to make sure that all those encounters can happen, that they're easy, that the technology is easy to use, but also that it just feels um, very natural and, and not forced. And so we're working really hard with their team really across the whole firm to talk through all those nuances, not just amongst ourselves, but how do you bring that to the table with the client so that you can have that real conversation about how things do work, 
But most importantly, how do we, you want to see things work in the future? And how do we create a design that propels you to where the organization really wants to go? Yeah, we were very excited about this, Stephanie. Sorry, I love that. Us, I love that. that and yeah. Lots of, not surprisingly, questions and interest around hybrid. Uh, there is a question, is there a trend towards more concierge or high-end experiences for employees in the hybrid workplace? Okay, so I'm going I'm to challenge yeah. Tom. Tom, one Ooh, sentence yeah. or each from both of us so we can speed round through a whole bunch of questions. So I'm going to say absolutely yes. One of the main things about going to the office is getting something that you can't get at home somebody to service you, somebody to provide that extra le that level. It's really almost like taking it to a hospitality level. Tom. You said it. Done. Yeah. Let's go to the next one. <laughs> ah, some folks casting a little bit of a gloomy cloud with the talk of a possible recession in yeah. 2023. What impact, uh, if at all, do you see that having on hybrid and the workplace? There could be a shift back to a rather than an employee centric driving to an employer centric. And I, and I don't mean that the employees aren't important anymore, but just kind of like who's driving the bus. Right. And so what we often see with the layoffs, people get a little bit more nervous about jobs. And also you probably um, will see a little bit more uh, concern about being seen and being present. So we're already starting to see a little bit of an uptick in people maybe wanting to be seen a little bit more in the workplace. Great. But to that end, I think we need to keep in mind that the notion of being in the office for five days a week, I don't think that exists, right? So the, the need for flexibility, people's ability to be seen, to be heard, mm -hmm. to be valued in office is just as critical as those days that someone might choose to work from elsewhere. Yeah. And we conducted a poll on LinkedIn in advance of this conversation, and we asked folks, what do you value most about working in the office? And the results were 59%, hands down, collaboration with colleagues. And then mentoring and advancement, 22% valued that the most, 10% just the kind of ergonomic settings and spaces designed for work, maybe not your dining table, and 9% corporate culture. Does this align with what you're hearing today from your clients? Yes. Yes. And, and I, I would say, I think it's really important, uh, Stephanie, one of the biggest reasons people don't want to go back to the office, it has nothing really almost to do with the office. It has more to do with the commute, right? If the office was right next door, would you go? And for a lot of clients, it's like, yeah, if I didn't have to commute. And that goes back to that recession question, because, mm. you know, we're already starting to see in Europe where they're being re hit really, really hard with gas prices. It can have an impact about, are you having to pay for commuting to an office? Are you having to buy lunch that day? Are you having to pay for parking? And then if you stay at home, are you paying more in heating bills and or electrical bills or, you know, all those other things? So you gotta, everybody's got to work that out. Yes. Well, we've got plenty of questions coming in, but I do want to kind of keep to some of the other big topics that we did yeah. want to talk about. So, okay. You were one of the first people to talk about the importance of designing workspaces to support the needs of neurodivergent people. And you had started to touch on this a little bit earlier. Yeah. Have clients embraced this call for inclusive design? And do you anticipate seeing more of this in 2023? Absolutely. So, so first of all, Stephanie, when, when we were asked this question by a client six years ago, I, most of the people in the room didn't know what the question even meant. And we had an answer, but not a great one. And so we really dove into this topic. Um, now this topic is coming up all the time. It's in RFPs, it's in interviews. There are standards that are being written. We're working with IWBI to incorporate it into guidelines. There's all kinds of stuff that is being talked about. And, and thankfully uh, it is because we all are being impacted by the assault of the senses that are coming at us, that sensory stimulation that we're getting. We're overwhelmed by it. You don't have to be neurodiverse to be overwhelmed by smells or sounds or visual stimulations. And after the pandemic, we have a lot of people that have a heightened sensitivity to that. So this is not just about people that are at the extreme ends of the neurodiversity spectrum. It's about everybody on that spectrum and really understanding that our built environments have a massive impact on all of us and understanding how that impacts us and to be able to design spaces with an intent 
is really important. And I'm going to go back to something that Tom said that I think is really important. Tom talked about before COVID, it was a lot of standards and drive to densification, et cetera. I'm just going to ask, who is the average person that we're designing for today? And what is the average task that they're doing? I don't think anybody can answer that question. And so I, I think in a way we went way too far in trying to standardize for that average worker. And we need to embrace something right now that is we are all different and one size misfits all and creating spaces where people have more options, more choice and more control is absolutely essential for all of our mental and physical well-being and for us to be able to function at a higher level. Are we seeing clients kind of from surprising market sectors or regions that are embracing this? Uh, I, the, the cat is out of the bag. It's run down the street and it's had kittens, Stephanie. Okay. I mean, Honestly, you know, we're doing this in airports. We're doing this in healthcare. We're doing it in arenas. We're talking about it in workplaces. We're talking about every public space that you can imagine that people go into. It's a huge issue. I mean, look, going to an airport is daunting for anybody, mm -hmm. right? And just, you know, so if you're neurodiverse, it can be overwhelming and debilitating. And so I, I really think that we as a firm have embraced this notion that we have an obligation to really design spaces that are welcoming for everyone. And we take that very seriously because if we believe that design can have a powerful impact on individuals, we need to acknowledge that powerful impact can also be negative if we don't do it right. And that's not an option in our world. So we've spent a tremendous amount of time really focusing on understanding the ramifications of the spaces that we're designing the principles, the elements, to make sure that we're making it as welcoming to the greatest variety of individuals possible so everyone can be successful in spaces. So picking up on that phrase, powerful impact. Tom, yeah. we are in the midst of a climate crisis. Yes. What changes do you see the design industry making, specifically the interior design industry, making or uh, things that they're embracing this year to really help address the crisis and to make change? Sure. I, we've been in this crisis for a while. The pandemic only exacerbated things. And then reading things like in the news today about, you know, uh, we've had the hottest number of years mm -hmm. across the globe um, in just what, since 2014. It, it's, it's apparent that we have to change the way we are thinking through the built environment. And I get excited about a couple of different things. Um, first, around the, the interior environment, there's a lot of physical stuff that is, is needed to create a space. And so being thoughtful around those materials, where are they coming from? How are they recycled? How much content inside those materials are recycled. Um, who's got ownership over these products, right? Yes, the client pays for it and puts it in. What I'm excited about when it comes to carpeting is all of the major manufacturers are tracking where their product is being installed so that they know they could go back and take it back when that space is done being used or the carpeting needs to be replaced because they see value in that product because they could recycle it and make new product from it. And so we're seeing organizations be very mindful around the things that they're making and the value that they make for the organization long term so that they have an investment, you know, it's almost their raw materials in terms of their their um, product cycle. Um, I'm really excited about uh, thinking through products that can be reused. Um, our team in, in London did a really great project um, where all of the products had some sustainable bent. They all came from uh, the country, they all came from Great Britain. Um, a lot of them were reused products. They were furniture items that were on at other sites or were uh, resourced from um, organizations that buy product back. And so the idea that somebody could create a really beautiful design solution by thinking through 
and and selecting elements that could be put together in a new way, but they already existed and didn't need to be manufactured is really uh, important. And I think the opportunity for those products to tell a story or be a part of a story is really important. Um, I had the chance to, to, to speak on behalf of an organization called Heirloom, where manufacturers can work with Heirloom to put a code on a piece of product, let's say it's a chair, and that QR code, if as an as an individual in the space that goes to sit in that chair, takes their phone up to it and and copies that code, they'll learn the story of the product and where the product might have come from. And as it gets reused over time, that story will continue. And so we'll get to understand the value that these objects have and that the impact that they have on others over time. And I think if we start to all think about the way we're making spaces, the way we start to assemble design solutions, being mindful that this could go on well beyond what we're creating in that moment is a very exciting design opportunity. And I think our teams and our clients are now uh, challenging all of us to really think about that in a holistic way. Yeah. And I know at least our team internally, and I'm sure many, many others are measuring they're measuring performance. They're measuring everything in ways that perhaps hasn't been as common in the interior design world as it's perhaps been through engineering or architecture. Uh, so that's the one side, the performance side. But you've also alluded to, you know, we have sustainability and climate, and then there's well-being and wellness. And there's a, a question that we're seeing come up. Uh, has sustainability and wellness become even more important with the hybrid workplace. Oh, and another one on biophilia as I got that yeah. out. <laughs> yeah, so look, I'm gonna say it's always been important. We've just mm -hmm. ignored it for a long time. And, and I think what is really happening, I, I don't think actually we're really addressing one of the biggest issues is that the way that we work has become unsustainable. We're not working for 30 years, nine to five, and then to be better off than our parents were, right? People are having to constantly relearn. They're working longer hours. The, the work can follow us anywhere that we go. We're not working for 30 years. We're working for 40 and 50 years. And so at some point, the, the way that we've done this has just become unsustainable. And I think now is an opportunity. You're seeing a lot of people basically say, we want to take a little bit of control back. We want to work hard and we want to do meaningful work. But there's got to be some balance here. And I think that's actually a really healthy thing for us to be to be discussing right now. And we have to provide you know, space to support that in the office. So yeah. thinking through where people can be a little bit more mindful, a little bit more quiet, uh, take some moments to be peaceful, um, make sure that, you know, we're accommodating for people's beliefs and their ability to be in a room for thoughtful prayer and that it's it's built into the space. It's not an afterthought. So, you know, really making sure that all those moments matter and that that, you know, it's it's a whole treating individuals in a holistic way, I think goes to Kay's point about the fact that we are working longer, we are working harder, but how do I take some of that back for myself? And yeah. so I think the designer space has to support that. Yeah, and reconnecting with nature, Stephanie, I think is really important. So the whole question about biophilia, you know, nowhere in nature is there a rectangular white box. Like <laughs> it doesn't exist, right? And so we need to start thinking about that. And and biophilia doesn't mean putting a plant in a corner and calling it a day. There are a lot of ways that you can incorporate biophilia. In fact, most of the ways that we do it, most people don't even see, you know, so I, one of my favorite projects is one where there's a, a metal ceiling that's dropped and it's perforated kind of at an, an unusual pattern, but it emulates walking through a forest with light coming through the mm. trees, right? And that connects us in a way that most people just don't necessarily think is really super obvious, but that is an element of it. So we need to be thinking about biomimicry, biophilia, connecting us more to nature, getting us outside yeah. more as well. More and, more, more, right? more and more of our projects have an outdoor element. And yeah. that connection to the outdoors, the connection to the outdoors just through 
getting daylight in view into every space possible within an environment. Those those are table stakes now. We, we have yeah. to do that. Um, and promoting movement. I can't tell you right now a project that does not include some kind of stair element that's connecting multiple floors to f- really get people to move through the space. Um, and that movement is is part of that, that idea of wellness. Well, they call it a stairwell for a reason, Tom. <laughs> of course they do that. <laughs> Uh, but it does beg the question, who on the, the client side, kind of what scale of client is making this decision? We've had a question, are companies that are midsize or smaller as focused on design and willing to spend on it? it I, runs I, the continuum? Yeah, yeah. I, I, would, I would say that good design can come at any scale, yes. any size, it, it should always be part of every single project, right? Any space that people are in, you're making a conscious decision, whether it's going to be well-designed or poorly designed, make a good choice. And I, I think there are table stakes that can be applied to any project, going back to access to daylight. <laughs> if, if we start thinking through just good planning, all of a sudden the space could feel a lot better than maybe an existing condition space that they're right. in because now everyone has that access. I, there are simple things that can be done no matter what. And then yes, you know, if you can afford cla- you know, class A space and a new building that has roof terraces and staircase, sure. But also we're working with clients that are in suburban New Jersey that you know are just looking for us to create a wonderful gathering space inside their environment so everyone can come together every day. That's a game changer for that organization. Yeah. Well, we are coming up on the end of our time, but we have a few more questions. So just wanted to throw out one that I thought was interesting. Um, We always talk about data. Everyone is data rich and maybe understanding poor at this point. But one of our, our participants is asking what workplace analytics are clients focusing on? in this hybrid workplace? Are they looking at occupancy? Are they looking at usage? Are they looking at energy costs? And I guess the other part of that is, you know, what are they looking, what are they trying to solve for with that data? Yeah, so the answer is yes, 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 and yes. Are all, they're, they're looking at all of those things. I'm gonna make an argument though here that why, why do we design space in the first place? We design space for people. And people are 80% of your cost. And we need to understand that having happy, healthy, engaged, empowered workers who will work harder for you any day than somebody that's a disgruntled, unhappy, unhealthy, we all know that's the secret formula for getting people to be more productive, right? And so I think we need to focus more on human-centric measurements, access to decision makers, access to mentors, engagement, empowerment. Do they feel a sense of purpose? Do they feel tied and connected? Do they have a sense of belonging versus how many square feet are they sitting in? Because I have never in my life had a CEO say, oh my God, I lost sleep last night because Joe is sitting in 150 square feet. (laughs) But I have had CEOs say, we're worried about losing our talent We're worried about them not being able to be effective or efficient. We're worried about them sleep watching, walking through the day in presenteeism and, you know, and the long term longevity of our company. So we're we're focusing on the wrong things and we need to start thinking about human centric measurements going forward. The data does help us make some initial decisions with clients around things like utilization, you know, the biggest question we've seen a lot of corporate clients have right now is they're trying to assess how many bodies are going to be in the space at a given time, given that they're working hybrid. And so, you know, we're spending a lot of time up front analyzing how many people might be utilizing a space on a given day so that we have some parameters to design around. And we call it Easter Sunday when we know everyone might show up. So our clients are saying, okay, what's that average day? And can you accommodate everybody? Because there's going to be a day that everybody shows up and there will be because special announcements, special training sessions, special whatever. And so you have to understand what all those different slices of, of the day might be and different components that are going to come to help uh, determine that, that square footage in terms of occupancy. So yeah, these numbers help us at the initial get-go, but then 
Kay's right. We're, we're trying to design for for the people because that is the biggest investment these organizations make. Okay, one more kind of lightning round question. Do you see companies moving away from large kind of headquarter campuses into smaller regional offices? We Earlier on, we had talked about the hub and the spoke. Do you see any clear direction on that? I, I think personally, and Kay might see it otherwise, I think we're actually at a point where clients are making investments in that kind of campus environment and bringing people together. We have talked with clients where the hub spoke home piece might be important, um, depending on what kind of work they do and what kind of you know size of an organization they are. But I feel like we're at this moment in time for us, you know, at HOK, where we're really focused on those those environments, those centers, those hubs that are going to be those moments to bring people together, large groups of people in the organization together. Yeah, I would say know thyself. For yeah. some clients, that collective synergy of bringing everybody together is the secret to their success. And it's imperative that you have that interaction and that synergy of people coming together. For others, not so much so. And they can afford to maybe have people that are more spread out and or dissipated. And maybe for them, that hub home spoke where you have offices that are closer to people's houses. And I think right now, I think that the common thread between both of those models, whichever one is right for your company and what your work styles are and you're trying to achieve, is maximizing the efficiency and the optimization of your real estate, using it wisely. Right. And so does if if everybody isn't there every day, do they all need to have dedicated desk? If if not, everybody's coming to the office. Do you have to have all of these amenities that are dedicated to your team or can you partner and share and create more districts and and precincts with other companies that then kind of have that spillover and create that energy and that vibe in an area, not just within your own spaces. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think understanding who you are, your organizational DNA is the start. Stop. Stop worrying about what everybody else is doing know thyself and plan accordingly. All right. That is a perfect place to wrap. Uh, Thank you both. We've had tons of questions. So everyone, I hope that you've enjoyed the conversation. If we didn't get to your question or you have additional thoughts, please leave them in our comment section and we will get back to you. If you don't follow Kay and Tom on LinkedIn, please do so. And thank you all so much and have a great afternoon. Thanks, Stephanie. Great to see you guys.